So uh, we are on our next episode of the work item. So Courtney and I, we have a special guest this week, uh, Amanda Silver. Welcome, Amanda. Thanks for having me. Very excited to have you, Amanda. It's exciting to be here. So Amanda, tell us more about uh, what you do for, for folks that don't know. Uh, I am. I run the uh, the product management, design, and user user research teams for Microsoft's developer division. That's a big job. It is a big <laughs> That's job. A very yeah. big job. Yeah, I'm covering I mean, a lot I, of a ton of territory. So yeah, would Microsoft, you dig into that a little bit? Yeah, Microsoft from the from you know its inception has always been a, a developer focused company. I mean, if, you know, if you even think back to Bill Gates's days. Um, and then with Steve Ballmer, developers, 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 and even with Satya, you know, he talks about developers all the time. And and certainly with the most recent GitHub acquisition, uh, you know, doubled down on the importance of developers to Microsoft. So, you know, the developer division, as Satya would call it, is a storied organization. But basically, it's a it's a part of Microsoft that has kind of existed for at least 25 years, longer longer than I have been at the company. And I started about 19 years ago. Um, and from the get-go, basically, they, they built tools for developers and all of the developer platforms. Um, so in the olden days, <laughs> before we had, uh, you know, smartphones, uh, depends on how you want to define the olden days, but um, we were still using floppy disks. Um, you know, the developer division worked on Visual C++, Visual Studio, Visual Basic, um, and then kind of, you know, what it looked like to build Windows applications. Mm. But over the past, you know, 15 years or so, we've really dramatically kind of uh, diversified how we think about developers and who is our target audience. And, and you know, even over the past 10 years, it's taken a pretty dramatic shift from a strategic perspective. Um, and so now our strategy is basically to target any developer building any app for any platform. So Microsoft has this like super strong history in creating developer tooling. Do you feel like anybody rivals it in terms of like history? Um, it, do we look at anybody else to like say, hey, they're doing it right, or you know, there's definitely been those acquisitions. Like GitHub is is a great example of this, where they came into the field and they kind of revolutionized the way that developers work. And we said, hey, we want to be a part of that. But like, is there anybody else's story you feel doing that, like paying attention to developer experiences? Well, I don't know that there's anybody in the industry who has had such a long focus on developers and has has such a a legacy of product after product after product that that um, seems to be doing well amongst developers. Um, but also, you know, I would say Microsoft's history is a little bit speckled in all of this, in mm -hmm. all of this. And even my career in 19 years, I've seen definite ups and downs in terms of, you know, how uh, receptive the developer market was to thinking about Microsoft. Um, in terms of, you know, competition, I would say like, there's nobody who I think has as much breadth in terms of what uh, we do. Um, but I think for certain verticals, you know, then we might look at, at you know, what they would be doing. So, you know, certainly for, for mobile applications, we always look at, at Xcode and, and Android Studio as, as comparisons. You know, if we were to look at, um, you know, Python development, for example, or Java development, we would look at JetBrains. Mm -hmm. um, you know, DevOps, uh, you know, has, has not existed for the entire time that I've been working on developer tools. Um, but DevOps tools as a category, um, certainly GitHub is, is definitely one that, that, you know, we had been paying attention to for many years before we, we bought it. Um, but you know, they, they have competition from Atlassian and, and, uh, GitLab and before that yeah. IDM. So, yeah, you I know, think yeah. For, for our listeners who aren't like super familiar, you know, there was a time in, in the past where Microsoft probably was looked at like, you know, 10 or 20 years ago where there's like patent battles going on with Linux, right? And it wasn't like the best situation for, it didn't make us look the best, right? As from yeah. Microsoft perspective, like, um, you know, it could I think some people have called it like, you know, the empire, right? Yeah. Like we did some things that maybe weren't, um, there were bad habits in the community, like needed to build back trust a little bit. 
Yeah, I mean, and 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 I think you know my career kind of followed that trajectory through, through you know um, both the the Java C sharp slash dot net uh, introduction, right? I started at Microsoft right after the first version of dot net launched, and so I was working on the very next version of Visual Studio that was after the first introduction of dot net, um, and that was you know just the idea that we would compete with Java at the time was kind of just bonkers because <laughs> Java had Java had such a a huge, you know, um install base. everything. Yeah. And from an enterprise perspective, it was just absolutely uh, a monster in terms of, you know, uh, how much enterprise adoption there was. And so to introduce something that was brand new that would compete with Java. Um, that was a big deal. And not only that, it was also, uh, you know, we had a pretty very, you know, very strong legacy and very strong uh, user base who were using Visual Basic 6 and uh, C++ at the time. And so, you know, from a lot of folks, um, the reaction was, why do we need something like .NET uh, if Visual Basic 6 is, is working for me? Mm -hmm. So for many years, the conversation was not was not um, not squarely just about Java. It was also about how do we think about Visual Basic 6 and evolving Visual Basic 6. And I remember it, this is where uh, it's funny you brought up Visual Basic 6. That's how I learned how to code. I, mm -hmm. I think like, was it 1998? And this was the first thing that I, I tried and the excitement of being able to drag and drop buttons on a form and just see it like it will render exactly as it is. And I don't have to deal with Win32 APIs at all. And it yeah, was yeah. so easy and so nice. And I remember it was a bit of a transition to .NET. When I got Visual Studio .NET on these a bunch of CDs, I think it was like seven or eight CDs that I had to install. And I recall that the, the transition to C Sharp and especially with kind of the focus on that was why can't I do this just as I could in Visual Basic 6? It's so right. different. And it's right. like now there's an object model. I have to create like a new form one. And but with that, it just emphasized the fact that Microsoft was so big on developer tools that even with those changes, I think nobody could come close just to what you described as like the breadth and the quality of the dev tools. And just you could do everything in Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Build any application. Uh, I, I think ASP.NET was part of that. Yeah, ASP.NET was was part of the first versions of .NET. And you know, I mean, we're now we're now scratching it at what would be considered in in the tech industry ancient history. Right. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this was that was the transition from, you know, fully client applications to client server applications and and even web. And this was also, you know, the era where there was still a fairly negative impression of Microsoft amongst web developers. Um, and that, you know, lasted for at least another decade, possibly 15 years after that. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't until even when we were working on introducing TypeScript, uh, mm -hmm. which we started working on in 2010 and released to the public in 2012, um, you know, again, the idea that we were going to introduce something that that would appeal to JavaScript developers and web developers who still had a fairly negative impression of Microsoft yep. in that era. Uh, I, I, yeah. I love that you brought that up because I was part of the transition at Stack Overflow that we went through that, like, you know, adopting TypeScript and converting everything over. So that's, that hits home for me, right? It's like, yeah. okay, we're going to go with TypeScript. All right. Yeah. And we were when we were launching it, it was, you know, we really felt like it was a long shot in terms of, you know, whether or not this would get um, traction in the in the general market. Um, you know, the the reason that we did it is that that office at that era was transitioning from being a purely client application to being uh, what is now Office 365, but basically, you know, web hosted anywhere access tools. And we had thousands of developers inside of the office organization who needed to move from C++ uh, or C Sharp into uh, basically JavaScript or web 
web, you know, hosted applications. Mm-hmm. There was no web assembly at the time. There was nothing that, you know, you could really truly compile down to. And there were all kinds of different approaches that that were being taken both externally and internally. Um, internally, a project called um, Coffee Maker had been created. Uh, and and there was another thing called Script Sharp. And so there, they each of them kind of tackled different parts of the problem. One tackled like modularity and, and encapsulation. And the other one um, tackled basically how can I have a strongly typed language that compiled down to the re- web runtime. Um, and, you know, we, we got Anders involved and got uh, a guy named Steve Luco involved and, and um, Luke Hoban, who's now at Pulumi. And, um, and they, they kind of came up with TypeScript and uh, and then when we were trying to launch it, it was like and and thinking about like what does that go to market look like? It was you know our aspiration was that we wanted to make sure that the office. Sorry for the kids in the background. <laughs> if you hear them? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Saturday. You know, um, we wanted to or Sunday. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, that what the office team ended up developing with was not different than what the market general market would do because if they if they used something else then we'd end up with our own you know ecosystem and the web the mic the the um the office developers wouldn't be able to benefit from the evolution of the ecosystem and Mm -hmm. so what we were really hoping for was that we would get get market adoption and ecosystem adoption so that they could benefit from from the evolution of the web this is fascinating to me because that that assumes that there was research happening when, you know, our own developers were dogfooding this. You know, there's developer ergonomics that go around like, okay, they're using TypeScript to convert everything for like M365. And we have thousands of developers, like you mentioned, internally, we have so many people using it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're in charge of research, right? At the time, I don't know if at the time yep. you were kind of leading this up, but like, um, what was the process there? Like, I, you know, I'm a designer. So like, I love the idea of like understanding my user, and Mm -hmm. understanding how they're trying to get the job done. But developer audience especially um, can be very opinionated. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, there's so much nuance Mm -hmm. to writing code. Um, It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, a language. I mean, it literally is. How did you distill that and turn it into strategic direction, right? Like you're seeing, you know, okay, Office, our own internal developers are are having these problems. Does it match up with the market? Yeah. What's the contrast here? Like you said, yeah, we're, we're developing internally for use, but... It has to be publicly available as well and and usable. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you address that and kind of look yeah, at both I sides mean, of it? It was definitely a, a big debate because it's you know there's the path that we could have taken, which which I think Dart ended up taking uh, in part, which which you know was that it was a both a language and a runtime because they wanted to be able to have the performance characteristics that they were also looking for and. And the the reason that we didn't go in that direction was because um, which we could have and we were we were toying with. Um, but the reason that we didn't it was because we wanted to make sure that we were we were aligned with how the ecosystem was evolving and how the standards were evolving. And so about you know six to nine months into the project, you know we finally had a conversation about should we diverge from the ECMAScript standard. Or should we commit to always being able to compile down to the ECMAScript standard? In which case, we absolutely needed to make sure that we had a representation at the ECMAScript standards body and kind of helped to um, steer the direction of, of the JavaScript standard called ECMAScript um, to make sure that it aligned with TypeScript and that, that there weren't, you know, uh, there wasn't too much friction and they didn't kind of stray from each other. Um, so and playing, in terms playing of, nice yeah. there, like understanding yeah. their needs and, and trying to help instead of pushing against it. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really like a couple of things. First of all, you know, to have folks like like Anders and Steve and Luke involved, who are some of the, you know, world's best programming language and runtime uh, and and kind of programming API experts in in the in the field uh, work on the project certainly helped a lot i mean there is an aspect of of internal consistency in the type system and and kind of the aesthetic aspect of of designing a programming language 
um, which, you know, that's why we have programming language experts. Um, but, but there's also the strategic conversations about, about, you know, you can make something internally consistent and aesthetically pleasing, but if it doesn't have the right strategic qualities in terms of alignment with the market, in terms of thinking about the, the um, APIs and libraries that it needed to interface with, in terms of thinking about the ecosystem effects of how, how you would get to get the traction for, for a programming language like TypeScript, um, then, then we still could have, have been led astray. Um, but, you know, the, again, like coming back to the, the go to market, you know, our approach was very, very, um, uh, you know, I, how do I put it? We were, we were certainly humble um, in terms of our expectations for the traction that we would get. I mean, at best, we were hoping for, you know, at least being something that was in the JavaScript ecosystem that was a fairly common, you know, tool, maybe something like the caliber of like of, of, of frequency of use as, as prettier or something like that was kind of like what we were hoping for. Um, and 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 we also really focused on internal dog fooding first. And even that we were fairly humble with. It was not a mandate to the office organization to say that they needed to adopt this whole hog. And and it took mo many, many years before Microsoft was using it as the most dominant preeminent way to write JavaScript applications. Um, but it did happen, uh, but it took, you know, probably five years before it it was really you know in the in the way that everybody was thinking about how do you build a javascript application that scaled and i think it's a testament to the fact that your organization actually builds things that developers want and that kind of ties into that research and understanding the needs because there's often this kind of desire where you know as engineers we want to like oh this is the next cool shiny thing let's build it let like let's hope that the community will come as we build this awesome thing they will get it and then nobody gets it, and then it doesn't get adopted, and then it's all the wasted time. But it's just kind of this iterative approach you're describing. It's so fascinating how it, you know Office is a big org. Mm -hmm. To get them to shift to something completely new, like I, I started my career in Office, and there are some heavyweight products that shifting to something like a completely new runtime, a completely new language, it's not something that can be done in a week. It's not something that anyone is going to voluntarily undertake and say, oh, yeah, this totally makes sense for us to do right now. Let's all just jump in. So it kind of I think it's also a testament to the fact that the, the research and the understanding of the needs for developers has been so good that you actually solve the problem for them that they had. And it's like th this makes sense. And it's a problem that also serves the better community because TypeScript right. has massive adoption. Like if I look at GitHub right now, like. All the new projects that come out that are trending is like, oh, it has TypeScript involved in some shape or form. Mm -hmm. like, it, it, it's, it's not a matter of building something and hoping that they will come. It's a matter of actually understanding their needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I think to that point, like, you know, it's also with when working with Office as a customer, because they have so many um, developers inside their organization, it's very easy to fall into the trap of just building something that works for Office. Um, right, done that right. For for you know decades as well, and you know if I look at what's happening inside Dev Infra organizations at other other major tech companies, you know there's a lot of stuff that they're building that is internal tools that that only targets the internal developers at their company, and and you know the result is that over time they just don't get to benefit from the from the general you know collaborative. Um, open marketplace that is that is you know the developer ecosystem but i think i think that's also like what you were talking about earlier is also what makes it so delightful to work for developers as your customers because you know especially as a product person i love that developers are tech enthusiasts that they're early adopters that they're educated users um and so because of that, we can launch something in the morning and know by the end of the day whether or not it was a hit or it was a dud and yeah. have really high quality feedback and be able to respond to that. And, you know, as a product person, I live for that feedback. So that's, I just, 
I love that aspect of it. Right, right. This is one of those areas where I, I think like just by virtue of the fact that uh, what was called out earlier where developers are opinionated, it's the fact that that opinion gets translated to product feedback very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> shipping anything developer related just from some of the small project experiences that I had was like you, you get GitHub feedback, you get emails, you get forums where people talk about you without you even asking. Um, th th this is a fascinating area. And actually, it's a good transition to our next question. You know, we, we learned about some of your work. How did you get into essentially driving the developer division? How did you get on that career line? Like, what was something that motivated you from the very beginning to think of developer tools and jump into developer tools? I, you know, I started at Microsoft. Uh, I decided to come to my, I never expected to stay at Microsoft for 19 years or a career. Um, and I didn't even expect to be in industry for that long. Uh, but I was an undergraduate TA at my college and I kind of, um, I saw uh, going through the computer science department that there was this kind of elitist attitude towards who can be a coder and who, you know, who earned who earned the right to be a coder. And I always felt that that was was didn't make business sense. It didn't, you know, if we think if we want technology to actually be a tool for good, then we have to make sure that we have we can we can it's a it's a, a democratized. Um, accessible thing that people can use technology to build what they need to build. And so when I was considering what to do after college, I thought I was going to go, you know, I come from kind of an academic researchy family. So I thought I was going to go into academia or research science. And I decided to kind of take a detour through industry to see if I liked it or not. And also to kind of pad my lifestyle through graduate school. And um, and I ended up coming to Microsoft because the hiring manager, who is now the the GPM for VS Code, um, said, hey, look, you know, the best place for you to use your TA skills and to bring other people into the industry is to work on developer tools at Microsoft. And and he was right. And I think, you know, two to three years into my job, I was working with Anders on a fairly regular basis and and um, and. I realized that if I went back to school to get a PhD, I would probably go back and get a PhD in, in programming languages. And I might end up, you know, leaving and, and working on the same stuff that I'm working on. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I started on the job. But over time, you know, I could have also ended up going really into programming language design. And, and I think over time, I realized that that there's so many different aspects of the way that software development happens. It's not just about the programming language. It's also about the design and the user experience and, you know, the business reasons. And, and at the end of the day, software is, you know, it's about people. It's about the people who make the products. Um, and so, so I kind of started to get more interested in, in the diverse aspects of, of software development. Um, and, you know, one of the other aspects of that that has made my job interesting over the years that I've I've gotten I've gotten able to I've been able to work on basically every platform at Microsoft for always from the developer lens. You know, whether it's Xbox or SQL or Azure or Office, um, I've kind of done a tour of duty uh, so, the programming story for each of those. And so you mentioned, you know, your intro, like you didn't expect to be at Microsoft as long as you are. And um, I'm really fascinated to learn, like at the very beginning, what did your, you know, how did you realize like, hey, I want to be in language design? Because that's such a, it feels like such a niche, um, you know, for any of our listeners looking to get into this, right? Like understanding how to prepare yourself to get into language design, like programming language design. Um, yeah. How would you do I mean, that, right? Like how I, did you fall into that, you know? I wouldn't say that I still do that much programming language design, right? I manage teams that do programming language design and and um, build the experiences that correspond to those programming languages. Um, but, I, but we also do lots of APIs and lots of visual tools and, you know, basically anything that you can think of as an aspect of how software development is, is uh, done, you know, a portion of my team works on. 
Um, but for the first eight years or so of my career, I was pretty squarely focused on programming language design and API design. Um, I guess, I mean, for me, you know, part of it was just the challenge of, of you know, everybody always kind of thinks about it as a as a systems geeky thing to do. And, and you know, um, I love how, as in natural language, but also in, in programming languages, what you're really kind of working on is how do people think about things? How do people rationalize what they're doing? How do they, what is the sequence that, 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 you know, they follow in their head as they're working through a problem? And so that I just find incredibly fascinating. And if we can, if we can create better tools for the, that helps people think, I mean, what an incredible, you know, career that is. And, and, and thinking about things, you know, Visual Basic, like thinking about, and, and you work also on tools that help, like Visual Studio, that helps with like type ahead and suggestions yep. and like being predictive and, and yep. using AI, like actually using the computer to enhance the way that a human wants to write and understanding those nuances. Like you mentioned, it's not just about the language, it's actually about the user experience and how that human is going to interpret it and how can you make them more productive. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I really think it's fascinating and it takes a massive team, as you've mentioned, um, to does. understand all that. I mean, I'm sure that on the predictive tech side, there's probably a whole team dedicated just to that, right? And then we're talking yeah. 10 to 15 yeah. people or maybe even more. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that is that is a incredibly fascinating project that we've been working on for the last couple of years very intensely. Um, ironically, I had also started something that was similar to that at least 15 years ago, uh, where, you know, what we were dealing with at the time was, um, and this was probably in the first era of AI, uh, we were trying to help people understand how to end up with um, code that compiled. Could we actually give them recommendations on how they could augment what they had written so that it would just compile? Because uh, that's always the first step. And we were using uh, genetic algorithms, as they were called at the time, uh, to basically try to generate, you know, uh, recommendations to developers to help them compile their code. At the in that era, the physics of getting that kind of a system to work was it was not possible. We would have basically had to the the search space in terms of the the breadth first search that you had to do uh, in terms of you know there was no idea of of developing AI models that we would we would deploy post facto. It was kind of more like it would be running in the background and it would, you mm -hmm. know, we would try to generate it. It was just too much, uh, took too much memory. And over, you know, after about a year and a half of trying to explore that, it just wasn't possible for us to continue to, to go along that path. But over the past two years, we've been looking at something called IntelliCode, which you know, is this idea of like IntelliSense, which is that that statement completion experience that, you know, Visual Basic kind of brought into uh, everybody's consciousness, but now is a, a basic element of every, you know, code editing experience. Um, we're trying to think about like how, what's the next stage of that? How could that evolve? And and trying to think about, well, how could, how could AI and machine learning specifically um, help developers be more productive and help teams be more productive. And so we've we've started down many, many paths from, you know, just how can we help statement completion get smarter, um, but also how can we identify bugs? Um, and now that we've done statement completion, we can now look at much, much bigger uh, snippets of code, uh, you know, based on, on public GitHub repos and all of the source code that's out there, which didn't really exist 10 years ago, right? It, there just wasn't that much public code to actually go out and learn from and grok and, and build into a model that we could then, you know, bring back to the developer as they're writing their code. I think I at least partially credit my love for engineering to IntelliSense purely because back when I was growing up in Eastern Europe, we had no books on programming. There was no internet, and I had a copy of Visual Basic 6 installed, and I was fiddling with IntelliSense and just looking at what kind of properties does this object have? I wonder what this does without mm -hmm. actually having yep. that API doc 
IntelliSense was like, oh, you have the text property to set the text. Like, oh, cool, I'll try and play with this. It's a, it, it, today it sounds like such a typical experience. Like, of course you have IntelliSense. Of course you have this like auto suggestions with documentation and everything, but it, it's just such a productivity saver, I guess, or productivity increaser, mm -hmm. <laughs> whichever way you want to put it, that these kind of experiences they're describing even in IntelliCode where we often don't think about how much we actually need that and how much those experiences help us focus on the more creative task of coding. Right? There's this kind of debate of, well, if you know, if we do so much AI in code, then the AI will just write the code for us. Well, yes and no, because that enables us to be more creative because now I don't have to worry about the, the scaffolding and all this boring stuff. Instead, I think about how do I structure the algorithm? Mm -hmm. Where exactly do I have the opportunity to plug in my own knowledge about some domain space that is unique to me that I don't need to do the boring tasks. And it's it's fantastic where Microsoft is really pioneering in the space that I haven't seen any other tool or set of tools or services do that. And that's why it's mm -hmm. fantastic to see this kind of end-to-end -end integration. And now with code spaces, we see that on GitHub, we see this going into kind of the with uh, Visual Studio Online, where you mm -hmm. have this experience, not it's, only it's in your now, machine. It's now GitHub Code Spaces. We, right, we oh, yeah, GitHub Code Spaces. Yeah, the name, yeah, yeah. I haven't been in the ecosystem for some time, so that, that's why I yeah. don't know the exact name, <laughs> but uh, that, 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 it, it's fantastic. And just seeing this kind of end-to-end -end integration and with the shift to services, now we have the capability to augment that AI on a service side where we're no longer dependent on the memory on your local machine. We're no longer dependent on the constraints of the computer that you have locally. Right. Yes. I mean, I think I think over the past few years, we've we've transitioned to having application architectures that are cloud first in architecture, but we have not yet transitioned to having developer tools being cloud first. And in some ways, you know, we can think about the Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code experience um, as being an intelligent cloud, intelligent edge application because what we've done there is we've basically made it so that your local experience can be optimized for the typing that so that you can basically type it at the speed of your own thought but we can also use the power of the cloud to parallelize to do you know uh, machine learn apply machine learning algorithms and make make predictive recommendations to um, deal with storage that is much bigger than your machine could could access, and I think this also is is one reason why I why I um, enjoy the job so much is is also because I think with that comes even more democratization of being able to uh, learn how to code because if you think about it, right? Uh, if we have machines in the cloud that can host these kinds of environments, then that means that as a client, you don't need to have the honking machines that that you needed to have as a developer, um, you know, in the old days last year. Um, yeah, you literally just need a keyboard and like something to access the internet. And yeah, you need you a terminal. Yeah, yeah you can exactly. Use it from an iPad, a cheap tablet, whatever. I yeah. think that this is a fantastic point. Just that I love the, democratization of developer tool access by virtue of you don't need to spend a lot of money to be able to code. And we see that with other tools, uh, you know, and again, I'm a big fan of the work that Microsoft is doing in the space with things like Microsoft Learn, where I can try mm -hmm. Azure right away, like in with the, the sandbox, right? I don't have to pay, I don't have to install anything. I don't have to worry about SDKs, conflicts of libraries. It just works. And I get to focus on coding instead of focusing on trying to kind of set up my environment and figure out that, oh, I'm using an Android tablet that actually does not support the library that I'm trying to use. Right, right. I think there, there are like three really interesting things about what you were saying earlier about the importance to you of IntelliSense. Um, it's not just about productivity and kind of, you know, that you have to write fewer characters to type out what's in your head. Um, but it's also about the learning aspect of, of how you can actually see what is available to me to code and, and you know, hey, this is the search space that I get to look at to learn from. Um, and then I think there's this last aspect of, of, you know, the idea that the cloud could host all of these environments that can make it much faster for you to access. You don't have to do all this dev box setup. 
it can, you know, you can access a GPU or something like a specialized hardware um, or even an emulator for a piece of hardware that that um, you might not otherwise have access to. Uh, and you can actually build meaningful software for that. I think that's pretty incredible. It, it is 100 percent. Like I said, it, it's a pioneering space that I just see your organization totally excelling in. And to, to that extent, again, kind of tangentially to the topic of uh, building organizations, uh, you are a product person. And um, that's something that a lot of times when I talk to folks that I help kind of break into the product space, they have like, I don't know how to break into product. I was an engineer by trade. I you know, come from academia. How did the transition happen for you? Because back you know, 19 years ago, um, the knowledge around the product space was vastly different than what we have today about you know, what a product manager does, what a director yeah. does. What was that for you? Well, I would certainly say that the, that the discipline has evolved over the years. And I've, I've been, you know, uh, I've, I've bared witness to that evolution. When I started at Microsoft, I think there was still this idea of a technical program manager. Uh, but it was a it was a term of of derision in some ways. Um, you know, I think they sometimes referred to the best PMs were were clippies, like you know, clipboards that would take notes at meetings, uh, and and make sure that everybody had the same understanding of how they exited the meeting. And and I think that over the past few years, and especially as we started to go after markets that that we weren't, we didn't have traction in. When we needed to go after markets that were new to us and we needed to learn about who were our, our who were the users that we aspired to have and what, how we started to kind of really do a ton of qualitative interviews um, to understand what, you know, we talk about the white space, like what are the, what are their biggest problems that are being un, unmet? And what is our opportunity to address the problems that they're facing? And you know, the, what we talk about in my team all the time is this idea that like to disrupt somebody's workflow means that you have to have something that is of substantial value above and beyond what their current workflow is today. And so you, that starts with identifying what are the problems that you're going to go after because you know you need to be able to see when you're looking at a target customer what problems are they faced with and and how acute is that problem what is the behavioral evidence that that problem is so acute that they are searching for something to uh, fill that that void um, and then then you kind of need to look at your own product ideas um, in terms of you know the the we go through basically what we call like a hypothesis progression framework that we've kind of formalized our our thinking around how do we do product development in my team. Um, it's very cross disciplinary across PM and and design and user research and engineering, um, but it basically follows this progression from who's my target customer to what problem are they facing to what are the concepts that I have that might address the problems that they're facing, and then ultimately to the solutions um, that we think might address the problems that they're facing. And so it requires a lot of intellectual honesty and, and rigor um, to examine really closely how acute is their problem, how acute is their need for some better solution, and then have we actually come up with a concept or solution that is valuable enough to disrupt their workflow. And so we, you know, we will continually uh, go at it until we're confident in that. And basically we won't, we won't go big on our go to market uh, until we are confident that it, this is actually addressing the need of the customer because otherwise it's kind of a waste. You mentioned you mentioned when you started that, like your product development process kind of starts at that ideal customer. Like, who do we want to have using our products? Not necessarily mm -hmm. who is using them right now. Yeah. I think that's an like, important differentiation, right? Like, you could probably stay in an echo chamber making product improvements and development efforts, like focused on just the feedback you're getting from the current audience you have. But like in the case of, you know, GitHub, it's like, 
the GitHub acquisition, that was like a very specific, you know, we had an audience there that we wanted to grab um, and like kind of get, and those are the customers that we wanted, right? And that's like, we're, that's the space we wanted to work in. Mm-hmm. Um, so from your perspective, like, how do you define that to your team? This is, these are the customers we want to have, you know, like yeah. all up, here's the, I'm going to just, just give you the vision, you know, yeah. what does yeah, that yeah. look like for you? So for, for me, one of the things that I try to do with the team is to be very clear about what is a business objective or what is business value and what is customer value. And I try to get most of the team mostly focused on customer value almost all the time, because if I have everybody focused and executing on how can I make my customer's life better, or our users' lives better, um, then, then you know, I have this fundamental core hypothesis, which is that if we build products that people love, then we will figure out how it's relevant to the business over time. Um, so that's kind of the primary thing. But I do think that kind of coming back to the conversation about when Microsoft realized that it needed to go after customers who it didn't really have today, and it didn't, you know, in that TypeScript era, in the era when Azure was coming up, you know, there was this realization that that if we only went with the customers that were Microsoft developer ecosystem customers today, then Azure would end up being exclusively a .NET cloud. And if Azure was exclusively a .NET cloud, then we really wouldn't be one of the top clouds, top public clouds. To do that, we really needed to diversify the set of customers that we were going after. And specifically, that meant Linux developers, and it meant, you know, JavaScript developers and Python developers. And um, and so we, at that time, you know, the goal was to dramatically increase the number of developers, but also to diversify um, the set of developers that considered Microsoft in their tool chain. And so that was the business imperative. But then from there, we had to go to our different teams. We created a team that was going after Node developers and another one that was going after Python developers. And we basically asked them to go look at the white space. What's the, what are the problems that those developers are faced with? And if there's an entrenched competitor in the market, what is their unmet needs? How can we, how can we help? Yeah, right. and I mean, you That's mentioned good. that, like, you got to also be brutally honest as a, like, like you have to be reflective on your own teams. Like, okay, maybe we have a, a shortcoming or like, we're looking at this at the product or this specific vertical. And it's like, man, there's a lot of opportunities here and we're not meeting them. Um, yeah. You have to be honest. Like and, and, we gotta, and we're going to have to do something, you know, we got to pour some more that, time. Effort. Totally. Um, sorry, just my kid is, is trying to break into the door. Lucky, luckily we put a lock on it. Uh, uh, he, he is being occupied, but anyways, um, yeah, I think you're the point that you're making about, about the, the intellectual honesty and kind of, the, the brutalism of that, uh, that actually really represented a massive cultural shift for our organization. Um, in that, you know, I spoke a little bit about the hypothesis progression framework, but one of the most powerful aspects, and I, I also spoke about the importance of language in, in terms of how you think. Um, but for us, one of the most important cultural shifts for us over the past few years has been the use of the word hypothesis. Um, And the thing that is so important about that is that it basically represents psychological safety for the team, right? If, if, you know, in our previous culture, the, um, the way that, you know, you kind of got people to follow you and you got to build product and things like that, it was very like, you know, vision led, very technically, uh, technically led, um, in terms of kind of, you know, technical excellence or aesthetic technical excellence. Um, and certainly we still that continue to value, value those things. But what we try to do now, and this is also something that I think Satya brought into the organization, is to continually learn about our users and how we can refine our products to, to better serve our users. And the use of the word hypothesis gives people the room to come to the conclusion that they were wrong about something. And I kind of call this like the moment of epiphany. We have a boot camp that we run everybody through as they start in the division and they spend a week doing a customer development workshop 
um, where they interview customers, they have to write down their hypotheses around who is this person, what are the problems that they're faced with, you know, uh, what kind of a solution would address their problems. And we always make them write down everything that they think before they go into the customer interview, because we need them to have this moment of epiphany at some point during that week where what they thought was going to be true about the customer, they find to be not true. And when they come to that realization, that's when they, it's kind of a wake up call. They realize that, wow, you know, my own intuition is not enough to guide me through product development. And I need to actually listen to my customers and I need to test uh, what I'm creating, continually test it um, to know that I'm on the right track. And this is actually a also a question that I have. You called it out very early uh, into our recording that you're leading uh, not only the product aspect, but also user research and design. And mm -hmm. this is something that typically folks don't think about, you know, in terms of design or user research when it comes to dev tools. They're like, well, engineers will build it, right? Because it's for engineers, by engineers, they know what to do, they'll build it exactly what a developer needs. How do you bring that culture of doing user research, doing this kind of hypothesis testing and understanding what your customers actually need and then designing around that. What's your approach to that? Well, first of all, I mean, I think I think one of the most important aspects of, of creating a balanced organization uh, between engineering and product disciplines is, is bringing the rigor to the product discipline. Um, you know, my expectation for my team is that we do thorough analysis, we are intellectually honest, uh, we can show our homework. Uh, and we are constantly bringing a mix of both qualitative and quantitative research uh, to make the, make the case. We also try to enlist our engineering counterparts in the conversation as well. We want them to be as close as possible to the customer. Um, and so, you know, we have this philosophy of zero distance between the, the customer and our engineering team. And, you know, one of the things that has certainly helped with that is the culture of open source and GitHub and, you know, having all of this feedback coming through GitHub issues as yeah. a great way to facilitate that. But there also continues to be this kind of, um, you know, there's a difference in terms of the breadth of our user base versus those who contribute to GitHub issues. And so we also need to make sure that our team continually is exposed to our target customers, not just our ex our existing customers who are deeply engaged on our on our you know GitHub issues. Um, but but it's this it's this process of basically bringing them through, bringing the users through quick pulse studies, watching them go through our our you know getting started experiences, um, observing. You know, I, I often I, I I often think about my job as kind of half anthropology and half craftsmanship in that uh, what we need to do is to basically observe our users and understand what tools are working for them, what's not working for them, why did they why did they end up using that tool? Uh, you know, what were their motivations? What was kind of surrounding everything that that got them to that point? And then, and then craftsmanship in that, you know, you're not done once you solve it. You actually need to continually hone the product to make sure that it gets better and better and more tuned to the needs of your user base. Um, so that's that's kind of how we approach it. Um, and and it's you know it's again as cross disciplinary and as active as possible. Some people have a user research organization that go months ahead of what the engineering or product uh, discipline is doing. That is not the way that we run our team. Our user research team is very much embedded with both the engineering team and the product team. Uh, and you know we're doing we're doing on the ground daily customer acceptance testing of all of the products that we build. You mentioned the zero distance between, you know, it doesn't matter who's in the organization, right? It could be an engineer. It could be a, a designer, a researcher. Um, what does that look like practically, like in the day to day or the, the week to week? Or how do you kind of um, set that up at an organizational level? 
um, to ensure that there's continued cadence and like continue because you could do it all up front, right? Onboarding, like get into the mm-hmm. org and do it for the first month and then it could fall off. And so mm-hmm. um, how do you ensure like a natural cadence? Do you guys do a, you know, all up, like we're going to share some insights that we gathered from the product team or um, what's that look like? Well, it's, it's, it's this idea that we're continually learning and continuing to refine the products. Um, and so, you know, we might have a federated set of products that we work on. Like if I think about, you know, Visual Studio Code, I have the Visual Studio Code core team, and then I have the team that's working on TypeScript, and I have the team that's working on Python, and the team that's working on notebooks experiences, and those are all basically different feature teams. Um, and so within that, within a feature team, I would have a number of PMs and a number of corresponding user researchers and a number of corresponding designers that they would work with most closely. Um, but the expectation is, and kind of the the you know internal competition we have is like, how can we learn as quickly as possible as an organization, respond as much as we can to the learnings that we've had, and then you have business results that demonstrate mm-hmm. that you that the learnings that you've had um, are are um, you know dem- demonstrative of the learning that you've you've kind of facilitated as a product manager. And, fa- and failure is okay, right? You mentioned that like whole hypothesis totally. mention of like, hey, look, like we have this product team has this hypothesis. Let's say it's like a kind of a wa- wild idea. It's a wild hair. I think that there needs to be room for experimentation. I know it can be yeah. frustrating to be on a team that's afraid of experimentation, right? And ex- and afraid of failure. It's like, okay, we're trying to every quarter hit our OKRs. It's like, okay, let's take a long shot occasionally, yeah. right? Like, yeah, we want to build a stable product, but we also want to try some bold things. And that's also an aspect that that of um, of of creating democratization in the product strategy and the actual product development, uh, you know, in that we want to uh, enable anybody in the organization to come up with a transformative idea that or even just a, a small refinement on the product. Uh, and so it's really important that we're super clear about what are the objectives that we have you know, what, how can we all row in the same direction? Um, provide that team a framework too, like, you know, cause you might exactly. be somebody that's like lower on the team or, or somebody that's like just an individual contributor, but you have like a great concept to add to, maybe it's like an additive thing to just a small feature. But like you said, if you have a framework there and a process to follow, you can get your idea kind of envisioned or at least yeah. try it. Well, and, and I think, you know, there's this um, resistance I think a good test of whether or not you have an empowered organization is if in a meeting where you're talking about the product progress and the next steps, is the highest paid person in the room doing all of the talking or are they doing most of the listening? And in my view, they should be doing most of the listening and my job and the way that I think about my leadership team and what they should be doing in the organization is coaching everybody on the team through that learning process. So it's, you know, if imagine I have, I have a, you know, very large scope and surface area in terms of, you know, all the different fronts where we need to compete strategically. Um, there is no way that I have every aspect of this in my head. I cannot be the the you know strategic mastermind between how we drive all of this. Um, my job, the way I view it, uh, as I've gotten more senior, is to create the systems and the processes that facilitate great product hunt, right? Great you know uh, refinement, great study of who our users are and and that we're coaching new people on the team to learn how to study our users and how to build products that delight them. And at the end of the day, that translates into the quality of the products that you ship. Because when everyone feels empowered to have their ideas heard, when they feel empowered to experiment and not be afraid of failure, that's when you have that room to come up with the great ideas that we now see translated in Visual Studio. We see them translated in Visual Studio code where if there's that hesitation where, well, we don't know, there's already an editor for this. We shouldn't be reinventing this. We shouldn't be building this. That there, There's always very easy to kind of fall back into this kind of an aspect of no, let's just not. 
versus when you have that room for failure and it can be calculated failure. It's not just about coming up with totally wild ideas and saying that, oh, whatever, yeah, we'll try it out and see how it happens. Like you have the data, you have some input. Um, that That is, I think it's a very unique and a very, um, I want to say high velocity organization that can, that can do that. And, and it's something that translates and we see that again in, in the work that you do. So I know we're kind of getting to uh, the, the limits of our time. And I wanted to ask uh, if somebody listening, you know, we have a lot of folks that are in college, that are in high school, that are still kind of growing into this. What's your advice to them if they want to break into kind of the, the same kind of career journey that you went through? What are some of your learnings and recommendations? Huh. Um, I think at the end of the day, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was that your career is a marathon, not a sprint. And there are times where it can feel like it's a marathon of sprints. Uh, but, but the thing that is the most important in terms of identifying what to focus on is what it, what renews you what gives you life what is the thing that that can sustain you for a you know multiple decades as you progress through your career um and for me it's come back to this idea of of democratizing technology through developers and giving developers more uh empowering them to bring great ideas to life um and and bringing you know more people into the developer ecosystem and so i would say that's the thing that's kind of the most important to find early in your career is is what is the thing that you think is kind of the core of your mission, your personal mission statement that's going to keep you engaged because you know as you get older you have kids you have uh, you know maybe bad bosses you have all different kinds of struggles that setbacks, um, all different kinds of struggles that make it hard to engage 100% at work. And, and if you don't have something that is a driving force for you, um, that, that motivates you, then I don't think you can continue to bring your A game. Um, but I also will say the other thing is continually learn, right? If you look at every interaction, um, with any human as an opportunity to learn something, then then I think I think that it kind of becomes like um, every conversation is a puzzle, every interaction is a puzzle. What is the thing that that I I'm learning from this? Um, and and that idea of it's a puzzle also brings a certain amount of engagement. So. Um, so not everybody's going to find developers as their, you know, as their muse, um, and not everybody's going to end up in an organization that that you know has a, a business and value system that is aligned with what their their personal mission statement is going to be per se, and not everybody has the luxury of of um, being able to pursue a mission like that and be well compensated for it and not have to, you know, deal with the struggles of financial burden or other things like that, that might take them in a direction that that um, is is less aligned with their career interests. So, you know, I, I feel incredibly fortunate, but I think at the end of the day, it, it really comes back to, you know, what is the thing that it's going to make you excited to get up in the morning and go to work? One of the things that stuck out to me listening to you talk today has been your focus on, you know, human connection and like this whole anthropological side of like understanding how to build systems to work better, just better with humans, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about code and we're talking about tech, but um, what it really boils down to is like, can you build great connections for your team and can you lead them in a way that gives them vision? You know, you're not, you're not making decisions for all of them. You're just hurting them in the right direction and trying to make sure that you're, you're fostering this this great relationship and this kind of candor around that whole philosophy you just mentioned right find your muse and and get the team rallied around it and get them excited mm -hmm. and that really spoke to me i guess out of all of this is just your kind of focus on those those human connections um and not getting so lost in the, the little micro details of the work yeah 
<clears throat> oh, absolutely. And I think I, I'll speak for all our listeners, but we've all learned from Amanda a lot today. <laughs> um, and so, Amanda, where can people find you online if they want to connect? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter with uh, Amanda K. Silver. Um, that's probably the, the place where it's easiest to reach me. But obviously, you know, LinkedIn, you can easily find me and other, thing, other places like that. I'm not a huge blogger or anything like that other than our product blogs. Um, I've been thinking that I need to do more writing, um, but you know, it's it's always between doing the writing versus doing the product development, and right. <laughs> I always end up uh, more on the side of of doing putting my energy into the product development. It's the priority. Amanda, thank you so much for being on our show today, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Great, thanks, folks.